Hello, sir. Can you still see and hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Ms. Sewell, before lunch, we had just looked at the board minutes from the 30th of April 2014 meeting. And the expectation that was expressed at that board meeting was that Deloitte would be providing assurance about the integrity of the system records logs. And that was in the context of subpostmasters challenging Horizon. You and Mr. Ojard had been heavily involved in the Deloitte work on Project Zebra, hadn't you? Yes. And you read the report when it was delivered? Yes. Can we have the report on screen, please? The reference is POL 001-07160. And we can see the title on the front, Horizon Desktop Review of Assurance Sources and Key Control Features. Scrolling down a bit, draft for discussion and the date, the 23rd of May, 2014. Going to page 31 of this document, please. We have here at F, under key, this area, key matters for consideration, hardware controls over the audits to over the audit store. And it says this, the Centera EMC devices used to host audit store data have not been configured in the most secure EC plus configuration. As a result, system administrators on these boxes may be able to process changes to the data stored within the audit store. If any, if other alternative software controls around digital seals and key management are not adequately segregated from Centrera box administration staff. Privileged access to the crypto cryptographic solution around digital signatures and publicly available formulas on the on MD5 hash digital seals would potentially allow privileged users at Fujitsu to delete a legitimate sealed file and replacement with a fake file in an undetectable manner. What did you think when you saw that Fujitsu could delete a legitimate sealed file and replace it with a fake file in an undetectable manner? So t to the best of my recollection, I would have talked to Deloitte about this particular finding. And to go through it, it was a theoretical possibility because you would have had to have, this was about the administrators who looked after us, after the hardware itself, and the administrators who would look after the database itself, coupled with um, being able to um, digi digitally seal and provide the MD5 hash. So you would have had to have a number of people to collude in this. The, the, the point, the, the other point at this point in time, and I do vaguely remember this, was my surprise at being able to do that because my understanding had always been that, and I think I've covered this in my witness statement, that it was a worm solution. So it was right once, read many times. So the, there was nothing you could do with that audit store once it was, um, once a transaction had been applied to it. So this was something that you had hitherto thought not possible? Yes, that's correct. Then under G, the first bullet, or G, branch database, we observed the following in relation to the branch database being the method for posting balancing transactions was observed from technical documentation which allows for posting of additional transactions centrally without the requirement for these transactions to be accepted by sub postmasters as transaction acknowledgements and transaction corrections require. Whilst an audit trail is asserted to be in place over these functions, evidence of testing of these features is not available. Then at the third bullet point, 
for balancing transactions, transaction acknowledgements, and transaction corrections. We did not identify controls to routinely monitor all centrally initiated transactions to verify that they are all initiated in action through known and governed processes or controls to reconcile and check data sources which underpin current period transactional reporting for sub-postmasters to the audit <coughs> store record of such activity. And then at the bottom, controls that would detect when a person with authorised privileged access used such access to send a fake basket into the digital signing process could not be evidence to exist. Again, what did you think when you read those aspects of this report? So this one was more material for me because it actually um, demonstrated that um, a transaction had been inserted into the branch database. And for, forgive me because, so I'm trying to recollect from the papers that I, that I was given as part of, part of the inquiry. Um, and um, the, the, and it, was, it was around the, the balance and transaction that was the material point because I didn't think, I didn't think it was possible. This report established, did it not, that something that Second Sight had been assured could not be done, mm -hmm. could actually be done. That's correct. And knowing the importance of the issue to the integrity of Horizon audit data, mm -hmm. and given your involvement in dealing with Second Sight, did you not think it was important to bring this to their attention? So at, at the time, the business had, or post office had, a separate, um, it was a separate organisational structure to deal with, with Second Sight. And the person who was on that organisational structure, who was party to this, was Chris Orjard. So whilst I didn't directly um, tell second sight of this, um, I would, would have thought rightly it would have gone through that structure. Did you seek to identify any assurance work which needed to be completed in response to the report? So, um, and I have a real gap with um, what happened after the Deloitte report. Um, and largely because I haven't had that much information provided by the inquiry. And the second half of that year w was very um, heavy for me in terms of um, what was happening with separation and Fujitsu as an exit and supplier. Um, from memory, and these are very vague memories, um, I do remember the an escalation. Um, I think that information security were heavily involved in this in terms of actions. Um, and I've seen reference to a meeting that I potentially attended as well at that point. But I have a, I have a real gap in terms of what, what did or didn't happen after that. I'm, I'm really sorry. Do you recall who within the post office you discussed the Deloitte report with? Yes, I do. So I definitely spoke to um, I would look at Chris Orjard and Paula Venice. Could we have on screen please POL three zeros? Three one four zero nine. This was the Project Zebra Action Summary. And um, we can see there the date, the twelfth of June two thousand and fourteen. And the author is James Reed Rees, apologies, reviewer Emma McGinn, review and sign off Julie George. Do you recall those individuals? So I do recall Julie because I recruited Julie. And what was Julie's role? She was head of information security. 
in essence, this is a document dealing with what the organisation needed to do to meet the Deloitte concerns. That's right, isn't it? Yes, it is. If we go to page six, please. And paragraph 4.2.2. And this is data logging. It says one point raised in the report was that it was possible for someone with privileged access to delete data from specific areas of horizon. This is always a risk with individuals using admin or power user accounts and is a persistent risk, one that needs to be catered for in almost any organization. Due to the sensitive nature of the information contained in the databases, monitoring of those databases should be put in place using technology to detect and record deletions and administrative changes to the databases. If possible, alerts should also be generated for mass deletions and high-level risk changes to database schemas. The recommended remediation here is the solution currently in place may be able to undertake the level of logging required within the Horizon solution, it is recommended that the current logging and logs are reviewed on a daily basis. This needs to be investigated further and the options on how to handle this defined through the risk management process and based on the solutions already in place or ones that could be procured to handle this. It's plain from this document, isn't it, that these people in the post office understood that data could be deleted and that would not be immediately apparent to the post office, let alone postmasters. As part of the output from um, the Deloitte review. Um, I, I'm talking in general terms from this document engaging with the Deloitte review. Sorry, I've it's my fault. I'll repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Looking at this document, which is engaging with the Deloitte report, mm -hmm. and we've been to the relevant paragraphs in that, certainly the people who were named on the front of this report understood that data could be deleted, and that wouldn't be immediately apparent to the post office or postmasters. So how, I'd, how, how I've read that since I've just, just received it, was that this was related to the audit file, the Deloitte, the Deloitte report. Okay. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind just, yes, so I could just scroll read scroll it, back up. if you wouldn't mind, because I, th this document I, I did just receive recently. Of course, if you scroll down to the bottom of page six, we're looking for 4.2.2. So the point here that's being addressed is the one raised in the report that it was possible for someone with privileged access to delete data from specific areas of horizon. So my question is, looking at that, which is engaging with that aspect of the review, at least the individuals on the face of this uh, summary document were aware of this fact at this point, that it was possible with someone for privileged access to delete data from specific areas of horizon. So that's, that's how it reads. Did you see this document in 2014? I can't recall seeing it. As I've said, I've got a real memory gap between the Deloitte report and into 2015. I've, ju I've just got a, a real gap, gap there, and it's largely because of probably everything else that was underway at the time. Could we have on screen, please, POL 003-46958? This is an email from Julie George, whose name was on the review and sign-off for that 
report we've just looked at. It's dated the 17th of June 2014, and it's to Rod Ismay, David Mason, Malcolm Zach, copied to Gina Gould. And she says this, and is attaching Zebra Action Summary, version 0 0.3. Hello all, I have tried to call you, Rod, attached a draft summary of actions arising from Deloitte's recent piece of work on the Horizon Systems. Clearly there is no blame attached anywhere, and this morning's meeting with Chris Day, Chris Ojard, Leslie, and Malcolm focused on what we would need to put in place as an organization to address overall assurance on all critical systems, starting with Horizon from 1st of April. <coughs> Detailing appropriate industry standards and controls, our business should be following against a risk-based priority mechanism. Rod, we would be happy to come to Chesterfield, however it would be better and more cost-effective if we could have a morning or afternoon in the next week or so at Old Street. We four will need to be comfortable that we have a plan going forwards, including indicative costs of undertaking for a risk and compliance committee on the 21st of July. We will need to engage with XCO members attached to verify and agree to support prior to the committee meeting. And then asking Gina to arrange a meeting between Rod, Dave, Malcolm and her. So it appears from this that you had that morning been at a meeting to discuss this with, among others, Chris Ojar. Does, does that help with your recollection of involvement at this stage? So I must have been at a meeting, but I, I, I really, I'm really struggling to remember it. Can you help at all with whether the recommendations were implemented by the 1st of April the following year. I'm sorry, I can't. That document can come down now, thank you. In 2015, Paula Venels was seeking assistance on remote access in advance of her attendance before the Select Committee. Do you recall that? Vaguely recall it. Could we have on screen, please, POL 3029812? And looking first, please, at page five. Scrolling down, please. Scrolling down a bit more, please. We have an email from Paula Venels, the 30th of January, 2015, 7.29 in the morning. And this is to Mark Davies and to you, subject urgent accessing horizon. And she says this, dear both, your help please in answers and in phrasing those answers in prep for this select committee. One, is it possible to access the system remotely? We are told it is. What is the true answer? I hope it is that we know this is not possible and that we are able to explain why that is. I need to say no, it is not possible, and that we are sure of this because of XXX, and that we know this because we have had the system assured. Two, you have said this is such a vital system to the post office, what testing do you do, and how often, when was the last time? And then underneath this, Leslie, I need the facts on these. I know we have discussed before, but I haven't got the answer front of mind. Too many facts to hold in my head, but this is an important one and I want to be sure I do have it. And then Mark to phrase the facts into answers, plus a line to take the conversation back up a level, i.e. to one of our narrative boxes, forward slash rocks. Thanks, Paula. The answers to those questions are set out in the emails which are further up in this email chain. So if we can just go, go through them. The one above, 
This is from Kevin Lenehan, 30th of January, to Pete Newsom. Pete, my phone call earlier today, refers. I need some urgent information as per Paula's note, please. And then above. Mark has dis discussed, can you hook up with Kevin to review what answers have already been provided to Second Sight as this should form the post office response? Then up again. And we have an email here from Mark Underwood to James Davison, copied to Kevin Lenahan. And he says, Apologies, if we can just scroll down, please, to the bottom of this email. And going back up again. There's no sign off there. Who was Mark Underwood? I don't know who Mark Underwood was. <clears throat> and he says, hi, Kevin, my proposed answer to the first question below it can be sent in its entirety to Mel and she can pick and choose, though this will need to be signed off by James as accurate, so James Davidson. In terms of the second question, I cannot find anything on the testing carried out. It could very well have been sent to one of my predecessors, but I cannot find it anywhere. And then in terms of question one, this question often phrased by applicants in second sight is, can post office remotely access Horizon? The answer, phrasing the question in this way does not address the issue that is of concern to second sight and applicants. It refers generically to Horizon, but more particularly is about the transaction data recorded by Horizon. Also, the word access means the ability to read transaction data without editing it. Post Office Fujitsu has always been able to access transaction data. However it, is, however, it is the alleged capacity of post office for Jitsi to edit transaction data that appears to be of concern. Finally, it has always been known that post office can post additional correcting tra transactions to a branch's accounts, but only in ways that are visible to sub-postmasters, i.e. transaction corrections and transaction acknowledgements. It is the potential for any hi hidden method of editing data that, that is of concern. Can post office or Fujitsu edit transaction data without the knowledge of a sub-postmaster? Post office confirms that neither it nor Fujitsu can edit transaction data without the knowledge of a sub-postmaster. There is no functionality in Horizon for either a branch, post office or Fujitsu to edit, manipulate or remove a tra transaction once it had been, has been recorded in a branch's accounts. The following safeguards are in place to prevent such occurrences. Transmission of baskets of transaction data between horizon terminals and branches, and the post office data center is cryptographically protected through the use of digital signatures. Baskets must net to nil before transmission. This means that the total value of the basket is nil, and therefore the correct amounts of payments, goods, and services have been recorded in the basket. Baskets that do not net to nil will be rejected by the Horizon Terminal before transmission to the post office data center. Baskets of transactions are either recorded in full or discarded in full. No partial baskets can be recorded to the audit store. All baskets are given sequential numbers when sent from a Horizon Terminal. This allows Horizon to run a check at the data center for missing baskets or additional baskets that would call du cause duplicative numbers. All transaction data in the audit store is digitally sealed. These seals would show evidence of tampering if anyone either inadvertently, intentionally or maliciously tried to change the data within a sealed record. And then automated daily checks are undertaken on JSNs looking for missing duplicate baskets and on the digital seals looking for evidence of tampering. I'm going down, please. And then we go back up. to the email above this. Kevin Lenahan then sends this to Mark Underwood, James Davidson, Melanie Caulfield, also on the 30th of January, 2015. This provides bullets in relation to question two. Just going up again, please.
And we have this from Kevin Lenahan. And this is the final answer in an email from Kevin Lenahan, Mark Underwood to Mark Underwood, Melanie Caulfield, copy to Pete Newson, Dave Holbert, you, Dave King, Julie George, James Davidson. It says, update question one, urgent action, accessing horizon. Mark Mel, James has had a look at your answer to question one and thinks there's too much detail for Paula. This was written for a different type of audience. He has captured the same points, but in a more appropriate format. He states, having looked again at the request from Paula, it appears that the fundamentals around this question, remote access, are not understood. I suggest that Paula is briefed along the following lines, and the lines of the following. One, no transaction data is held locally in any branch. Transactions are completed and stored in a central database and copies of all data is sent to a secure audit database. Two, sub-postmasters directly manage user access and password settings locally, so system access to create transactions are limited to approved local personnel only who are responsible for setting their own passwords. Users are only created following an approval process. All subsequent transactions are recorded against the ID used to log into the system. Three, once a transaction has been completed, there is no functionality by design for tra transactions to be edited or amended. Each transaction is given a unique number and wrapped in a digital encryp encryption seal to protect, it, protect its integrity. All transactions are then posted to a secure and segregated audit server. And then fourth, on approval, there is the functionality to add additional transactions which will be visible and have a unique identifier in the audit trail. This is extremely rare and only been used once since go live of the system in 2010, March 2010. Support staff have the ability to review event logs and monitor in real time the availability of the system infrastructure as part of standard service management processes. Overall, number six, overall system access is tightly controlled via industry standard role-based access protocols and assured independently in annual audits for ISO 27001, Ernst & Young for IAS 3402 and as part of PCI audits. Then at the bottom, Mel and Mark, I'll assume you're okay with this final position unless I hear differently. James has advised that he is contactable over the weekend. So going up to the top, please. We can see this was copied to you. On reading this email and knowing what you knew at the time from the Deloitte report, <coughs> do you think that this information being provided was accurate? The point around the balancing transaction, I understood it as being ac accurate. Well, let, let's have a look at which point you're referring to. <coughs> Scrolling down, please. So it's point four. So number three, once a transaction has been completed, there is no functionality by design for transactions to be edited or amended etc and then there's the fourth point which is an exception in effect on approval there is functionality to add transactions which will be visible and have a unique identifier in the audit trail extremely rare there's no mention here is there of the ability to delete <coughs> transactions for example casting right. your mind back to the points we read about in the report there isn't, and I can remember, and I can see in the documents I was provided with, that, and I, so from the, from the Deloitte report to um, January, I, I, I have a real gap because I, I can't remember what the actions were taken, and that's with deep regret from my perspective. The action, I actually asked Julie George, who was the head of information security, because I can see from the emails that I've been provided with 
I wanted to make sure that it was accurate information and I wasn't close enough at that time because of everything else that was going on. And it was a particularly difficult time for me. I wanted to make sure that it was accurate, the information that was being provided. I can't remember the deletion, the point about the deletion. And it's with regret if I have forgot it. But I had asked the experts who were close to this on a day-to-day -day basis to provide the necessary information. So I felt as if I had acted correctly in doing that. I'm sorry. Of course. Do you want to take a break? No, oh, I'm fine. It's, it's okay. If we can scroll up to the top, please, of this document. Just for completeness, we can see Melanie Caulfield there, Friday 30th of January. Scrolling down a bit, please, so we can see. Thanks again to everyone. This all provides the reassurance needed for Paula, in my view, re any questions that come up on this. If we get more queries on any aspect, I will let you know. That email seems, doesn't it, as though Ms. Caulfield has read the email below, at least to provide the reassurance that Paula Venels was seeking in that original email, i.e., no, this is not possible because. Would you agree? That's what it appears. And then the top email, Dave Holbert, who's head of IT services by this point, Kev, good outcome, and thanks for pulling all of this together today. Really appreciated. And that's to him and to you. And just, again, for completeness, could we have on screen, please, POL 00162308? And scrolling down, please, so we can just see the email below. We can see that's the email we've just been through the detail of from Kevin Lenahan, looking at the answer to question one. I'm just scrolling down so we can see that. And then going back up, please, to the top. That then appears to be forwarded by you to Mark Davies. Do you see that on Friday, the 30th of January? Yes. And there are no comments on that from you. Did it occur to you at the time that this was inaccurate in any way? My, my point of reference at this point, or the last point of reference, was the balance in transaction. And I can't recall actually read that. I must have read it if I've sent it on, but I can't. Reading it now, um, it's in there, the balance and transaction. It probably should have been clearer. Sir, those are all the questions that I have for Ms. Sewell. There are some questions from core participants. I wonder if we might take the afternoon break early at that point, just so that I can establish who and in what order and time yeah, estimates. Yeah, that, that sounds fine. Um, so if we can take 15 minutes now, so we're not pressed for time. Uh, coming, oh. coming back at 10 to please. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Hello, sir. Hello. We have questions from Ms. Page and from Mr. Maloney. Uh, Ms. Page will be no more than 30 minutes and Mr. Maloney will be no more than 10 minutes. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ms. Sewell, um, would you say that there were cliques within the Venels Perkins management regime? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Would you say that there were cliques within the management regime under Ms. Venels and Ms. Perkins' leadership? 
flakes, as in... Were there people who were in favour, people who then fell out of favour? I'm t uh, sorry, apologies, but I'm just trying to think to ans answer your question. I don't know whether I would call them cliques, but there was certainly you would have different groups of people who would come together. You describe in your witness statement at paragraph 73, and I don't need to take you to it, how you fell out of favour, if you like, and how uh, you felt you were isolated and unable to do your job. Now, I don't want to distress you unnecessarily, but that's how Wait, things ended. Sorry. That particular period was very difficult for me, and it still is very difficult, so I'm really sorry that I'm getting upset about it. Don't worry, don't worry. All I'm trying to get clear about is that that was a, an example, perhaps, of the way sometimes people would get the cold shoulder and find themselves on the outside. Is that fair? Well, I did feel like on the outside at that point. And can I ask you, um, can I ask you just approximately from when you felt on the outside, just so that I can have some idea of it? I don't need the details of it. It was, just... it was probably... Um, late 2014. Right, thank you. Now, you also described earlier today how you effectively fell in with using the word anomaly, even though in your own words that was a mad word to use and the correct word was fault. Yes, that's correct. Do you think that's the sort of thing that happens in a management environment where people have to curry favour, people have to get on the right side of those above them? So, I didn't do that to curry fa favour. That was a direction that um, we were asked to take. So, it wasn't about myself trying to curry favour. All right. Well, you also told us that no one had taken ownership of the 2011 EY audit, which had various actions following. So, that's the first of two topics that I want to, to take you to. Uh, overall, just to refresh, that audit in 2011, it exposed some problems around keeping track of who could access what within the Horizon system. Yes. And uh, the EY management letter said, this may lead to the processing of erroneous or unauthorised transactions. Yes. All right. Now, in January of the following year of 2012, there was an RMG internal audit report which picked up on some of the actions from that. Do you remember that? Yes, uh, because I requested it. You actually requested that, did you? Yes, well, that's helpful to know. All right, well, let's have a look at that. That's poll 3003-0217. And when we get there, I want to start, first of all, by going to page seven, where we see the names. Oh, sorry, I've given the wrong reference. Um, poll 3029114. I'm so sorry. That's the management letter. But um, we don't actually need to go to that. So if we scoot down to page seven, we'll see the names of those who received this report. We can see on the left, these are poll names, Susan Crichton, Christopher Day, Kevin Gilliland, Andy J. Jones, that's probably a, a relatively new name for the inquiry, um, Neil Leckie Thompson, yourself, Paula Venels, at that point Managing Director, so this is pre-separation, isn't it? And Mike Young, Chief Operating Officer. Now, am I right in saying that on the right-hand side, those are RMG names? Derek K. Foster, Internal Audit. Moya Green, Chief Executive of RMG, is that right? So, I recognise some of those names, but not all of them. 
Am I right in saying Moya Green, Chief Executive of RMG rather than yes. Paul? Yes. Yes. And uh, then we've also got Chief Financial Officer, Chief of Staff, Head of Risk, and then Ernst & Young themselves, of course, the people who yes. had written the um, audit and management letter. All right. Well, those are the recipients. So if we could then uh, perhaps have a look first at page nine. And what we see is at the heading, Appendix B, Update on Actions Arising from 2011 EMY Audit. So that's pretty clear what's uh, going on there. That's a summary of what EY had recommended. Is that right? Yes. And what we see down the right-hand side is the status of the actions. Yes. Uh, and it, we've got substantial progress made or further work required against each of them. Is that fair? Yes. All right. Um, if we now go back, please, to page three. Uh, what we can see if we... We don't need to read all of this page at all, but what we can see is that in the, it, it, there's a, a sort of a summary of key findings, and in the bottom half, E&Y management letter is the heading, and then... If we look down towards the, uh, the, 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 the single line paragraph below that, it says the findings summarised in Appendix B on page 9, which is what we've just looked at, have been shared with EMY and reflect our assessment as at the end of January 2012. And then we see, thank you, and then we see below that uh, a line management response we agree with this report and its findings and will act to progress the action within the agreed timescales. And that's, that's your uh, response, your management response. Yes. All right. Um, so there we are, January 2012, um, and all the actions either say substantial progress made or further work required. All right? Yep. Now... Um, what I want to do is go forward a little bit to May 2012 and to a briefing paper. And the paper reference poll 20143075. And at the top there, we can see it says, it's a briefing for Paula Venels, chief executive, and Chris Day, Chief Financial Officer. And it's about the Post Office IT General <coughs> Controls, Ernst & Young Audit 2011-12. Now, bearing in mind, of course, that Paula Venels was one of the recipients of that RMG internal um, audit report that we've just looked at. Um, if we just confirm, if, you, if you'd like me to, or maybe you don't need me to, if we see at page three, that's got your name at the end and the date is May 2012 on that paper. Does, do, you, do you remember doing this? Well, I've, I've just received this oh, right in see. the last few days. So, um, it, it, does it ring any bells? Had, did it ring any bells when you read it in the last few days? It, it didn't, but I was, in, I, was abs I was absolutely involved in it. I, co I couldn't remember the detail. Well, what I want to take you to is a bit of an anomaly, because if we look on page three, and if we uh, look specifically, I'm so sorry, page two, paragraph 3.4. So if we just look at paragraph 3.4, it says, it refers to that Royal Mail Group audit, and it says, uh, through an independent Royal Mail Group audit conducted on the post office systems in November 2011, it was agreed that all actions had been completed as planned. Two actions had minor activities still to be completed, which were addressed by December 2011. So that's at odds, isn't it, with what we just looked at, which said that everything uh, was still pretty much outstanding in January of 2012. Have you got anything to help us on to, to help us understand that anomaly? So I. I don't, but I can see in the appendix it included the observations. It does indeed. We'll go down to that, because that is also rather odd. If we go down, please, to... Uh, 
page four. Appendix A, summary status of the 2010-11 audit observations as agreed with the RMG independent audit in November 2011. Now, I hope you'll take it from me that everything uh, below that, um, the finding numbers, the EMY ratings, the summary of actions, is the same as the appendix to the RMG audit. But you'll see there on the right-hand side, instead of those words, substantial progress made or further work required, um, where substantial progress uh, uh, is, it w was the wording, it's now the, just the colour, green, and where further work was required is now just the colour yellow. And so that rather obscures, doesn't it, that there was still plenty of work to be done in January of 2012? So I, I, I don't, I, I really don't recall that. And I think it's unusual for it not just to be lifted. Um, was this briefing something that Ms. Venels asked for, do you think? <coughs> I have some vague memory of Chris asking for it, but, that, but again, I've got nothing to substantiate that, and it's very vague. This was the month after Post Office had separated from Royal Mail Group, and there was an ARC uh, meeting, the first ever ARC meeting, in this same month. Right. Do you think you got the message that loose ends had to be tidied up, that something needed to be done to make it seem like everything had been actioned when it hadn't? No. I, I don't recall anything of, of that nature. I think just, just by way of context, the 11-12 audit was a difficult audit because the 10-11 the audit, audit reported late. And um, so actions were put in place throughout that year. So some actions were completed part way through a year, not for a full year. And it wasn't until the following year that you actually saw the impact of all of the actions, um, um, completed actions taking effect. Well, would you accept that um, it was important for Paul at this point when it was separating to get a grip. As you said yourself, somebody needed to take ownership of the actions, didn't they? Absolutely, and I've said that in my witness statement. All right. Um, also in your witness statement, uh, you refer at paragraph 79, and I, I will take you to this, please, at page 40, to a call that you had uh, with Miss Venels in 2021. Um, that was requested by her and you took some notes, didn't you? That's correct. And that's the 12th of April of 2021? Yes. Now, um, I won't read out the whole of the paragraph. If we see um, there's a line there, Paula contacted me again on 12th of April 2021 via text message requesting a call. We spoke for longer and I made a file note and I'll take you to that shortly. Um, you say that there are a few things um, that, that perhaps um, seem to be the issues. First of all, it's about the Project Zebra Deloitte report. And then if we scroll down a little bit, There's a reference to your note saying PV got jumpy, and that's in relation to that seemed to be in relation to the Deloitte report. But it then says I can see reference in my notes to the EY audits. So if we just go to your notes, please, um, it's WITN 0084-0103. And if we go to page two, please. And we can see in that first rectangular box that you've drawn, EY audited controls. 
And then a bit further down, we've got 2012-2013, no material, overall control environment not sufficient, general IT controls. So evidently part of this conversation was about this period, wasn't it, when you had done the work to get the RMG internal audit, you had taken control and taken ownership. Can you tell us anything about what Ms. Venels wanted to say to you about all of that in this call? I can't remember specifically about the, the detail of what was discussed. I can vaguely remember the discussion around um, the ISA 34-2 and, and getting to that position. And um, again, I had no material, so I had nothing to refer to. Um, and I think there was reference to a number of issues which had come out of the earlier audits, but I can't remember any detail other than that, I'm sorry. You felt sufficiently uncomfortable after that to, um, to actually block Miss Venels, is that right? Yes, I did. Um, if I can move, please, to the second topic that I wanted to ask you about. Um, this is about your investigations, if I, that sounds more formal perhaps than it is, you looking into the receipts and payments mismatch bug in 2013 when Paul was responding to the second site interim report. And I ask these questions specifically on behalf of my client, Seema Misra, whose name I'm sure you know. Uh, and I want to explore the information you may have heard about whether that bug was disclosed in her trial. All right? Um, first of all, I want to go to poll 0037-1710. And if we scroll all the way down on this uh, chain when we get there, please. That first email in the chain is from Gareth Jenkins to you, um, providing you with his witness statement in the Misra case. Uh, and he explains a little bit about it. And it's evident that he's talking about a different bug um, that was disclosed during that case. Um, we've come to know it as either the Falkirk bug or the Calendar Square bug. And he says he's happy to dig out anything more um, and he says the key point is Horizon did have bugs discussed in court, but Paul still won the case. If we go up a bit, please, to the next email. Sorry, that just to confirm, that's on the 28th of June. You forward that to Alwyn Lyons, Martin Edwards and Mark Davies. Mark Davies, we can see, picks up on it. This is massively important. Is there also a possibility that all incidents... 14 and 16, that's the two bugs, have been referenced in court. And the 64 is the receipts and payments mismatch bug, isn't it? Yes. So if we go a little bit further up, Orwin Lyons says 14 unlikely. Um, Hugh, can we check or is it quicker to ask Gareth Leslie? So I think she's, that's a question to you really. Yes. Um, and then you respond, we'll ask FJ. And that's on the 26th, 28th of the 6th. That's a Friday. Um, if we go to the next email, it's poll 00137323, page one. We only need to look at your email on page one. This is on the Monday following that Friday, which is the 1st of July. And it's at 12.57. You say to Hugh Flemington, Orwin Lyons, Simon Baker and Roderick Williams, I asked the question of FJ if either, and you, I won't take you to it, um, I hope you'll take it from me, you, you're meaning either of the two bugs, if either had been referenced in any of the cases regarding these two issues, the answer is no. Um, 
Do you know who you asked at Fujitsu? I don't, but I do want to say I feel so deeply about all of the supposed masters and your client in particular. Well, I know you're doing what you can, so... But I, I can't remember who I asked in Fujitsu. Did you have a direct relationship with Gareth Jenkins? No, I didn't. So when he sent you that uh, email with his witness statement from that case attached, was that unusual? It was very unusual, and I think I've said that in my witness statement. So you don't think... I, I'm just speculating, maybe, maybe I shouldn't. Do you think you would have contacted Gareth Jenkins to ask him? I really don't know, because my, my main contacts at Fujitsu were um, the account executives. It was, it, was, it was rare that I would talk to people under the account executives. Well... Let's then just look at a different email from very much the same time, which may shed a little further light. Poll 3060587. Um, we can see that Mr. Flemington seems to have been at his kids' school sports day or something, but if we um, go down... There's a, an email from him slightly earlier in the day, so not a dissimilar time to the one that we've just looked at from you, 1316 on the 1st of July. Uh, and you are copied in along with a crowd of people, but also including John L. Singh. Um, and I just want to look at one particular bit, which is actually over on the next page. This is, this is a high level points for the board. And if we go to the bullet point in the middle of the page with four blank bullet points under it, and there's um, the final one in square brackets, which begins one. So all I want to look at is that one. One of the two defects has already been discussed in a court case, Misra, being confirmed. Now. We know that, in fact, it wasn't. But what I'm interested in is where that might have come from, where that, that suggestion that it was raised in the Misra case might have come from. Um, before I take you to anything else, have you got any free memory of where that might have come from? I don't. I'm sorry. Well, then, there's one other thing that I, I want to um, raise just to see if it jogs any memories. Uh, we have another email chain, and I don't need to take you to it, but I'll give the reference. It's poll 3098797. And at page two of that, it's clear that you and Mr. Ismay had been tasked together on the 28th of June, so on the Friday, to look into both the bugs. So do you remember that you were working with Mr. Ismay on that? I've seen in the um, bundle that I have that there were some emails which shows we were trying to find out more information. Did Mr Ismay appear to you to uh, have a, a reasonable understanding about the re receipts and payments mismatch bug? I can't remember. I can't remember if he did or didn't, but I would be surprised if he didn't. Well, certainly there's... There's uh, uh, evidence that shows that he was at that meeting that Miss uh, uh, Clark took you to earlier, which uh, in November of 2010, when the three solutions were being discussed. Yes. So that does tally up. And we also know that he was paying close attention to the Seema Misra trial. Um, was it Mr Ismay who suggested that the receipts and payments mismatch bug might have been revealed in the Misra trial? I don't know. I really don't know. What about Mr Singh? Did he say anything to you about the Seema Misra trial or the receipts and payments mismatch bug? 
I, I, I don't believe I had any dealings with Mr Singh. You didn't? No. You don't know him very well? No. I, I know I, he's been copied on some emails, but I didn't have any dealings with him. So it wouldn't have been him who said anything like that, at least not to you? I can't, not, not to me. All right. Well, thank you, Ms. Sewell. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Page. Mr. Maloney. Thank you, sir. Um, Ms. Mrs. Sewell, you worked closely with Chris Ojard on um, Project Zebra, the Deloitte report. Yes. <clears throat> and it appears that you were present at a morning meeting with him, referred to in the email from Julie George, attaching the Zebra action summary that Ms. Price has recently asked you about. Yes. Ms. Price asked you about whether you informed Second Sight about the ability of Fujitsu to delete transactions in an undetectable way, and you said that it would have been for Mr. Ojard to inform Second Sight. And that's largely because there was a, as, as I've said, and you, um, the inquiry will know there was a Project Sparrow set up. Yeah. yeah. And I, I was not part of that, so, so the line would have been through. Different stream. Yes. yes. And it would have been Mr. Ojard rather than you. Yes. When I asked questions of Mr. Ojard, I asked him about the Zebra Action Summary and the meeting you and he had with Julie George and others, just as you've just been asked by Miss Price. Yes. And I asked him whether or not he informed Second Sight about the contents of the Deloitte report and the um, Zebra Action Summary. And he said in response, the sense from those that were reviewing the Deloitte report was not that this was a critical or significant matter. And I don't know why that is the case. Clearly, the matter was considered and discussed by numerous people internally. It could be, and I don't want to speculate, but it could be that there were no persons with the requisite access rights. And that was the reason, or there could be other reasons for it. Now, I appreciate this is a difficult time for your memory. It, it, your memory is not great around that time. But do you remember you or any of your department saying to Mr. Ojard that there were no persons with the requisite access? No. Do you remember any, you or any of your department saying to Mr. Ojard that this was not a critical or significant matter? Not that I recall. Thank you very much. Is that it, Ms. Price? Yes, sir, it is. Well, um, Ms. Sewell, thank you very much for making your witness statement. And thank you very much for coming to give evidence in person before the inquiry. I'm grateful to you for participating in that way. Okay. Right. Um, so we'll adjourn until tomorrow morning when we have Mr. Cameron. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Bye. Thank you.